Sorry about that guys, it's always the danger of doing one of these in the middle of the day. This is the map of the known world. And so you see you, you've got the Mediterranean and a little bit of Europe, right? Maybe, you know, Tigris, Euphrates. But look at Africa, all right? You've got like the shoulder socket. And what is all this nonsense, all right? You kind of got the, uh, you know, Middle East right here. But what in God's name is this big body of water? And over here, this triangle is India, and there's no Australia. That is the map of the known world before the age of exploration. And the great Trans-Sahara trade route and the great Silk Road I go on and on about, that was the only way to move people and material during this age. It took years, it took time, it was a dangerous, laborious journey. And anything perishable, there's no way it could make it across this expanse in time. So what is going to be done about it? Well, at this time, we get several brand new, different developments in technology. Number one is a little device known as an astrolab, kind of a, uh, the, the protractor compass you guys have for math class. You take two of them, put them together, and an eyepiece, like a small telescope, and this part measures the distance from where you are to the horizon, and you record it with a celestial body, um, like the moon, the star Venus, um, the North Star, Big Dipper, the Sun, if you can. And by measuring that, that distance from the horizon, you can roughly tell how far you've traveled in a day laterally. Think latitude and longitude. Um, longitude is north-south lines, latitude is east and west. So it kind of helps to tell you where you are, but it's not super, super accurate. It needs a little bit uh, of help. So later on, a device known as the sextant is created. And a sextant is a little more accurate. Here is that 60 degree arc, kind of like your compass that you have for math class, probably for you guys in like the fourth grade or whatever. And it can help you measure the angular distance between objects. So to put this in perspective, 60 degrees is roughly the curvature of the Earth. So looking through the um, telescope, and bouncing it off of a mirror, you measure the ship's bow to the horizon to a celestial body, and you can now get a greater um, accurate measurement of where you are. And if you combine those things, the latitude, the, the longitude, you can put them on a map known as a Mercator projection. You can now create grids or squares running north and south on a known map. And it can tell you, using the sextant, exactly where you are in the middle of that square. For those of you who've read the Rick Riordan, Percy Jackson books or seen the movies, when um, Percy is out at sea, he knows exactly where he is. 54 degrees north um, with you know, 110 degrees south southwest lets him know where he is in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And with this, sailors begin to explore farther and farther and farther out from their home base of um, operations. Now remember, back in the ancient world, it was the Phoenicians who were the first to travel long distances. Remember the phone home Phoenicians? Well now, we're getting to something completely and totally new. And along with navigational advances, there are advances in ship technology, something known as the Spanish Caravel, which is a ship with a very high bow. The front of the ship is very, very, very tall. It sticks up above the deck. And it's high to act as a snow plow as it slices through the water and the big waves. And the main body of the deck is narrower. So the bow pushes the water away, and it allows the boat to slip through more easily. On a caravel, you will have two or three masts where you can hang your large sails. And what will come over from the Chinese and the Arabs is known as the Latin sail. Instead of the big square ones, you get triangular ones. And these are very, very, very important because all three of these sails you can rotate and swivel 
So if there's heavy wind to keep the ship stable, you can lower the sail and propel yourself forward. And a little bit of wind, you drop it all the way down to catch as much wind as you can. But if the wind is coming at you, if you've ever tried to like paddle like a kayak or a canoe upstream, it's absolutely brutal. Um, a couple years ago, I was out with my son. We went out in the morning, like fishing, and I tried to get back, but we were having a good time, and the tide was coming out, so I was like, Ugh, uh, just digging as hard as I could. I had to go like five more feet to turn into the little inlet, and my shoulders were like ripped like I was the Incredible Hulk. It took like an hour, and when I made it, I just kind of slunk there. My arms were so sore, I couldn't even really um, move them. So I looked kind of like um, Alexander, I guess, when he's done um, with one of his swimming competitions. So anyway, you're welcome, Alexander. Um, anyway, you could take these sails, and you could swivel them. So if the wind is coming at you, you could rotate the sail so it would deflect off the side of the ship. The sail behind it would curve it around and push it into the sail, propelling you forward. So instead of running into the wind, you shot it to the side, you shot it behind you. Think of like a, playing a game of pool or a rebound. And so you use the sails to swivel the air. So even if you were going against the wind, you could still use it to help move you forward. And it is the combination of these that will change the world between the 15th and 17th century or the 14th to 1600s. Um, and my clicker's not working, so I have to um, remember how to do this. Also, later on, um, they began to be able to articulate the sail, kind of like a Chinese fan or louvers on um, the blinds back there. A uh, little bit of wind, you raise, the, you spread out the sail. Um, a lot of wind, you shrink it down, greatly saving time working on the ship. So, with this, by the 1400s, the age of exploration is going to come on. You have with it um, the Renaissance has just happened. Science and technology and learning are put back into, into Europe. And also in the Renaissance, we have a new look at the human potential. What can the human being, him or herself, um, create? And so you add the Renaissance with the magnetic compass from China, uh, the sextant, the astrolab, and the caravel, and the world is about to change um, forever. And the big question is, why did Europeans want to go and explore? Well, the question is, why do explorers of any time do something? There's got to be something in it for them. And the easiest way to reduce it and boil it down is the three G's, God, gold, and glory. Sailors were told if we find a faster way of going to Italy, we or to Asia, excuse me, we will become rich. Right now, if we want something in Europe, it's got to go to a possibly a trader in Africa, a trader in East Africa, a trader in Mecca in the Middle East, all the way over to India. Each time it changes hands, all right, it gets more expensive. The people who are trading or buying the object, have to buy it, and as they resell it, they need profit. So they've got to raise the price. So the Europeans say, if we can cut out the middleman, all right, we can go around Africa, the Middle East, um, and go right to India or China, we've saved ourselves all of that money. Think of your parents going to Costco. They, or, or Sam's Club. They could go to Target, they could go to Food Line, Harris Teeter, even Walmart, but if you go to Sam's Club, there's no middleman. You're going right um, to the resource center, right? Right where you get a five gallon tub of Jif peanut butter for cheap because there's nothing in between. Um, you know, Walmart, um, Target, well, Walmart is Sam's Club, but you know, Target, Food Line, Harris Teeter, all of that stuff is the middleman. They have to raise the price of it to make their own profit. When you go right to the wholesaler at Sam's Club, that's all for you. So anyway, um, anyhow, and what people want are spices and luxury goods, especially the English. Man, they've been eating bangers and mash 
and fish and chips and shepherd's pie. And all of a sudden, people come back from like India. They have these crazy things called spices. And the British put it on their food. And you know what they say? Well, old chup, this actually has something called flavor. They're like, oh my God, this food actually tastes good. Before, it just tasted kind of like... I don't like just plain mashed potatoes. It was nice, but there was really no um, flavor to it. So number one, you can become rich. Object number two, it's always good to save the souls of the poor heathens. So European kings are say we're not only doing this to get rich, but we're doing it to save the souls. You're going to spread religion, and you're going to become famous. You're going to come back a rock star. You're going to be a normal average Joe, and you return from this trip, your name is going to be on the headlines of every newspaper, every news media out, outlook, Snapgram, Instachat, Facebook, whatever. You're going to be world famous. Everyone's going to know who you are. And some guys went just because they were simply curious. They wanted to know what the heck was going on um, out there. So... First guy we are going to talk about is Prince Henry of Portugal. He gets this whole ball started in the early 1400s. Um, Prince Henry, Henry comes down to uh, Portugal, North Africa, from Portugal to North Africa, where there's the Trans-Sahara trade route. This part of Africa, you may have heard of Africa, the Dark Continent. It has nothing to do with skin pigmentation. It's because nobody knew what the heck was down here. Prince Henry will come into contact with um, some Muslim cities in the north, and he will conquer them, and he runs into an African king named Prester John. And he forms a partnership with Prester John to try and halt the spread of Islam, but also to tap into the African gold trade. So he uses his money to set up navigational schools, scientists, um, cartographers, and brave sea captains to start sailing from Portugal down here to North Africa. And as he does, he begins setting up those trading posts with Mali, with Songhai, with Senegambia that we um, talked about. So that way, he has access. And his navigational schools sea captains began to sail farther and farther and farther down the coastline of Africa, recording what they saw. Okay, we have, you know, 10 gallons of supplies. When we get halfway, when we get down to five gallons, we'll, we will record where we are and head back. And so the next ship that comes down will take 20 gallons. And little by little by little, they work down the coast of Africa. Unfortunately, Prince Henry the Navigator does not live to see Africa be rounded, but he gets the ball rolling. He's the one behind like the sextant, the astrolabe, and eventually Mercator um, um, projection. Another um, man from Portugal, Bartholomew Dias, he will kind of pick up um, where Prince Henry left off, and he believes you can reach Asia by sea. Rather than traveling all the way over land through, you know, Turkey, over into the Middle East, Central Asia to China, we can do it by water. But he tries to sail around Africa. He gets down here around the Cape of Good Hope, and it's very dangerous. It's called the Cape of Good Hope for two reasons. Number one, when you got to the other side, you hoped you were close to Asia and you would become rich. The other reason it's called the Cape of Good Hope is you hoped you made it around. You have the Indian Ocean Current and the Atlantic Ocean Current, so the water is always very turbulent, and you've got Antarctica, so it's this rough bit of water, and it's infested with great white sharks. If you've seen Shark Week, the jumping great whites, well, this is where they live, so it was very treacherous to, um, to cross. Well, Bartholomew tries it, but he runs out of supplies and he has to turn around, but he almost gets all the way around Africa. And so he hands the, the baton to a Portuguese legend, Vasco da Gama. And Vasco is the first to successfully sail around um, Africa. He starts off with several ships and he loses many of them. 
Um, they did not know how far it was across the Indian Ocean, and his men begin to suffer from rickets and scurvy, and their teeth fall out, and they're malnourished, but they eventually make it to India. He found the direct route. And the few ships he has remaining, he piles them with cheap you know, goods from the source, and he sails back to Portugal, and he and every guy with him, those that survive, become instantly wealthy. They are millionaires. Rather than rest on his laurels, Vasco outfits several more ships, and they sail right back to India, and then he left behind volunteers. Guide who, who would board port facilities and buy warehouses on the docks. They would live with the locals and buy things good, cheap at the source, and have them ready when Vasco's ships returned in 1502. They were quickly loaded, cutting down sailing time and maximizing profit. So Vasco is the first to go around Africa. Very important. But now we start to get competition. Right next door to Portugal is Spain, and the Spanish won in on this. And their famous king and queen, Ferdinand and Isabella, begin to finance explorers to try and rival their neighbor Portugal next door. And the most famous of them is Christopher Columbus, <coughs> excuse me, who, as we all know, sails the ocean blue in 1492. Columbus thought you could get to Asia quicker by going due west, out into the Atlantic, which some people thought was flat. And he set sail, and he lands in what is today the, the Bahamas, you know, the famous resort community down in the um, Caribbean, Gulf of Mexico, where the big water park on Atlantis is. And Columbus believes he has found Asia. And he names the people there Indians because he thinks he's in India. And he sails around for a while trying to find China. But he never does. And um, good old Columbus, he does some, some horrible things. He treats a lot of the natives terribly. He believes he's going to find a lot of gold. And when he doesn't, there's a lot, lot of atrocities. He cuts natives' hands off. He kills many of them. And you can't overlook that. You can't say it didn't happen because it did. But what Columbus does do, I think sometimes he doesn't get enough credit for. Many people may have crossed the Atlantic, but nobody recorded it and nobody returned home. Well, Columbus does. And if you ever go to Norfolk to the um, Naval Museum, there are replicas of Columbus's ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. And you look at those things and you think crossing the Atlantic is a rough, dangerous body of water. Well, one of those ships would fit in this classroom. And the voyage took two months and they were out of water and Columbus, you know, was facing mutinies. And he says, go ahead and turn around or throw me overboard, but I'm the only one who knows how to read a map and a sextant. So shut up and deal with it. And they make it. Columbus not only makes it back, but he makes a total of four trips to the Americas. Unfortunately, he never realizes that he's not in Asia. And it's shortly after his death that another explorer says, hey, this is like Aladdin says to Jasmine, a whole new world, brightly shining, shimmering. It's not Asia, knucklehead, it's the um, Americas. Uh, but he's the um, first. Um, then England jumps in this game. Cheerio, you know, oh chap, we want our food to taste good, so I'm going to get the bangers and mash out of here, and I'm going to find a quicker route to Asia by going north. So John Cabot will sail from England, and he will go up into what is today Canada, into Hudson's Bay, the St. Lawrence River, and find out that it is really, really cold. And John Cabot is the first to chart most of the coast of the Americas down to around like, you know, Maine, a little bit above um, Massachusetts. So the Americas are starting to come into shape due to good old John Cabot a few years after Columbus's um, first voyage. And then we get to this guy, Americo Vespucci. He will set sail from Portugal and he will come over and sail around like North Carolina, probably as high as Maryland, 
down past Florida through the Caribbean to around um, what is today um, Brazil. And he is the one who says that this isn't Asia. These are two new continents called the Americas after him, North and South um, America. And so after Amerigo probably comes the most famous um, of, of them all. We'll get to him next. But if you remember that map from the very beginning, once De Gama and John Cabot and Vespucci are done, you get to see Africa looks more like itself. Um, this big body of water that was there has shrunk a little bit. India is starting to come into shape. We're still not sure about Australia and the Polynesian Islands, but we have the Americas, North and South America, which hysterically look real thin, like you could sail right through them. But, you know, within 25, 30 years of, of um, you know, Columbus, and even a little more than that, going back to Prince Henry, P Prince Henry, the map gets much better. Remember, these guys don't have GPS. They don't have, you know, phone. They don't have Google Maps. They're doing this all on their own. And the most famous of them all is Ferdinand Magellan, who will set sail 100 years or so after um, Americo Vespucci gets this started, a little around 500 years ago. Magellan wants to find a, a, a newly, um, a new travel route. And um, a guy named Balboa had discovered the Pacific Ocean, which he names Pacific, means blue and, and, and peaceful. It's big, I don't know about peaceful, but, but it is blue. And Magellan decides that he is going to um, circumnavigate the globe. And so he puts out an ad that he's looking for experienced seamen, guys who are not afraid to sail for an undisclosed length of time. He told them he could not tell them where they were going and how long it was going to take them. But if they were willing, they would be handsomely rewarded and they would be rich. And unbelievably, would anybody take that? I don't know how long we're going to be going and I don't know where we're going. Well, 250 guys do. And he equips 250 ships and um, 250 men in five ships, and he sets sail. And his, his voyage is fraught with problems before he gets to South America. His men are whining and complaining. A mast on one of the ships breaks, so they have to put in near Brazil and find another suitable tree and shave it down and re-equip um, the ship. And then they get down to South America around the Straits of Magellan, which are more dangerous than the Horn of, of Africa because it's cold. You know, getting around Tierra del Fuego, there's ice flows. The temperature drops drastically. There's the Atlantic Current and the Pacific Current trapped in between South America and, and Antarctica. And if I had time, I would play you a few minutes from a movie called Master and Commander where it shows Russell Crowe and his British sailors going around the Straits of Magellan, and it's just dangerous. But they make it. And then they go up the coast of South America, and they see Chile. It's, it's, you know, Chile is, is rocky, it's mountainous, and they turn left to go west across the Pacific, and they do so in the worst possible area. A little farther north, and they may have seen the Hawaiian Islands. A little farther south, and they could have seen um, the uh, resort areas of the Pacific, you know, Fiji, Tahiti, Vanuatu, places where they hold survivor games. But Magellan picked a spot right in the middle where there was not a daggone thing between him and the Philippines. So they spend nearly four months crossing the Pacific Ocean. Guys are dehydrated. They were eating boot leather. Um, they, had, they were out of fresh water and out of food when they make it to the Philippines. And good old Ferdinand is welcomed by some Philippine natives. They get some pineapples and some poi and, and whatever else they're, they're, they're doing, some, some sugar cane. And to repay the villagers for their kindness, he helps them out in a local war, a land dispute, something you should never get yourself in if you're not sure what's going on. And unfortunately, in it, Magellan gets killed. But one ship and 18 of his men make it back to Spain after nearly three years. And it's Ferdinand Magellan's men who become the first to circumnavigate the globe and sail around the entire world. 
on the bell rang, I have to hurry up. So by the time they're done, the world during the age of exploration looks much better than it does now, uh, much more accurate. The only problem for the Americas is soon after the New World is discovered, it begins to be colonized. The blue becomes French. Green is Spanish. The orange is um, Portuguese. Red is England, and this purple here is the um, Dutch. The New World is about to be colonized, and the people there are about to have a bad day. And what we get from that will eventually be known as the Triangle Trade. Raw materials will be taken from the New World. Lumber, tobacco, sugar, wood. Um, hang on a second! Clearly, if it's locked, there's a reason. Hi, hey, what's going on, Ethan? How are you doing, buddy? I'm I, sorry. I, I thought you were one of my students. Come I on. was. I just right. wanted to say hi. Hey, Ethan, I'm so You're glad. Not, I'm not, sorry I barked at you. We're on videotape. Thank you for I'm coming sorry. in to say I'm hi. Sorry. I said I knocked. You did. You did great. That was me. So hang on. I'm almost done. Alex and Corey, guys, um, go, go around, please. So you have raw materials being taken from, from the Americas. Uh, they will go over to Europe to be made into finished products which will be taken down to Africa and traded for slaves back across the Americas, the Columbian Exchange, the Triangle Trade, it all means the exact same thing. And the last slide, these are things that we get um, the, from Europe, gets from the Americas, corn, maize, a rich protein crop, pumpkins and gourds and squash, and from the um, Europe and Asia, um, Europeans will get things like cattle, sheep, pigs will be taken to the New World and rich grains like rice, wheat, and barley. And the nasty thing that the Europeans get, bring over our disease, influenza and smallpox. I've got to cut it short. I apologize. Fourth period is coming in and they think I'm weird talking to myself and trying not to walk in front of the camera. So anybody, anybody want to say hi? All right, no, to the camera, Will. Oh. Oh, all right, all right. So AP World, that is a quick look at the age of exploration. I'll see you guys Monday. All right, there we go. You're famous now, Will. And I feel bad I yelled at Ethan. I thought it was you guys coming to see me, so.